Good afternoon, it's Wednesday, March 29, 2023, and this is a Protect Our Province live briefing on long COVID. My name is Dr. Susan Koh. I'm a family physician who's been working in Richmond, BC for 30 years. I am a clinical associate professor at UBC and a member of Protect Our Province, BC. Protect Our Province, CC is a nonpartisan, nonprofit grassroots organization consisting of doctors, nurses, engineers, health scientists, and community advocates striving to keep the people of British Columbia safe by sharing accurate scientific knowledge about COVID-19. We begin by respectfully acknowledging that we are broadcasting from the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territories of the Coast Salish peoples, specifically the Musqueam, Squamish, and Salatruth nations. We are grateful to the Indigenous peoples who have cared for these lands since time immemorial. As settlers, we commit to do our utmost to uphold the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and work towards its 94 calls to action. For today's briefing on long COVID, we are joined by Dr. Rick Arsenault. Dr. Arsenault is an internal medicine specialist and clinical professor with the UBC Faculty of Medicine. He is the physician lead for the Provincial Echo Education Program for Long Haul COVID. He is also a founding director of the Complex Chronic Disease Program at BC Women's Hospital and the director of the Rapid Access Specialist Clinic. So Dr. Arsenault, thank you very much for joining us today for this interview. To thank discuss you. Yes, um, we are really happy to see you. Now, the last time I saw you 32 years ago, we were both much younger and you were the chief resident in internal medicine at St. Paul's and I was a fourth year medical student. But uh, since then you've been you got made such a huge contribution to the people of BC by starting the Complex Chronic Disease Clinic, the Rapid Access Specialist Programs, as, as well as now being the physician lead of the ECHO Educational Program on COVID. So what prompted you to specialize in these very challenging fields? I think it has to do with the fact that I've always liked working with patients, even when I didn't have all the answers. And I see myself as a, a partner in the patient's journey rather than having to be the expert. That gives me lots of leeway to work with patients uh, rather than having to know everything. When did you recognize the need to look after people with long COVID? Well, I recognized it be at the first few weeks of the pandemic, because many of us predicted that we would see this. And we were a little bit uh, surprised when some experts were stumped by what was happening, because this there's nothing new here. Hmm. Now, that's very interesting. Now, long COVID is a relatively new disease, but family doctors such as myself were managing more and more of these patients with long COVID in our practices. Hmm. Could you tell us what definition you use for long COVID, given that the definition is often so widely variable? Yeah, so I like to use the same definition as the Mayo Clinic. So I think you have a slide. Mm -hmm. So the Mayo Clinic in Rochester makes a, a distinction between post-acute sequelae of COVID or PASC and long COVID. Whereas some study, some groups see them as interchangeable. So for instance, it's very hard for me to interpret the data on metformin because the data on metformin used these interchangeably. Mm. It also makes it very difficult for me to interpret the data on um, the microclots because again, they use these interchangeably. So I'm, I'm not sure if patients with long COVID as I define it, have microclots compared to patients when you group them together. But the Mayo Clinic looks at post-acute sequelae of COVID or everything that happens after COVID as an umbrella term. And they've mm. identified three groups. The first group is patients with tissue damage. So patients with lung scarring, heart disease, blood clots. 
Second group they identify are patients with no identifiable tissue damage who present with a post-viral syndrome and usually have symptoms of pain, fatigue, sleep disturbance, brain fog, and unexplained symptoms. And the third group is patients with psychiatric or psychological uh, consequences of COVID, including depression, anxiety, and post-traumatic stress disorder. So when I'm talking today, I'm only talking about the patients who have the post-viral syndrome with no evidence of tissue damage. The thing to remember is that these are three groups, but they're not three in you know, groups that can't happen together. So often it's and. So I'll often see a patient who has loss of smell and taste, tissue damage with chronic fatigue syndrome with new anxiety or depression. And so it's important to realize that these distinctions uh, are not exclusive from each other. Yeah, thank you very much for that. That's a wonderful slide. Um, now, long COVID can affect almost every organ of the body as well as have an impact on the immune system. What are the current theories of what causes long COVID? So the predominant theory right now is that it's an overwhelm of the stress system that stays in the on position. And so patients have what are called activated glial cells. Glial cells are brain cells that most people haven't heard of, but that represent about 80% of the brain. And so the microglia become activated and set off a local neuroinflammatory process, which turns on the uh, immune system, which turns on the fight or flight system and has consequences all over the body. Yeah. That's really interesting. Um, now, who are the people that you're seeing with long COVID and how do they usually present? So patients with long COVID usually present with symptoms of COVID, but after the acute infection, they continue to have or continue to get worse with fatigue, sleep disturbance, brain fog, uh, pain and unexplained symptoms. And the unexplained symptoms tend to fall into three main categories, although it can be anything. And the three main categories are gut problems, mm -hmm. dysautonomia, which is the autonomic nervous system, most commonly presenting is postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. And thirdly, brain symptoms. And again, can be mm -hmm. almost anything. And that's why it's sometimes confusing because over 200 symptoms have been described. But when you group them into categories, it makes it a lot easier to see the forest from the trees because patients present with fatigue, pain, sleep disturbance, brain fog, and unexplained symptoms. And when you work them up, invariably, all the tests come back normal, which some physicians unfortunately interpret as there's nothing wrong. And mm -hmm. so I make the distinction between we can't find anything and there's nothing wrong. Mm -hmm. So... If there are no tests, how do you diagnose someone then that has long COVID? So long COVID is a syndrome-based diagnosis. And so it means that we have criteria and these patients fall along a spectrum. So in the milder version, they'll have something similar to what many of us have seen in young adults or teenagers when they present after getting mono and they're out of commission for six months, a year, and then they're back to normal. In the more severe versions, patients actually fulfill criteria for chronic fatigue syndrome, also known as myalgic encephalomyelitis and or fibromyalgia. Also, they can present with additional symptoms like migraines, irritable bowel syndrome, and other things that fall into the spectrum of a group of disorders called central sensitivity syndromes. Wow, that sounds like a lot there. Now, do you have any idea how many people in BC are currently being affected by long COVID and how many we've seen in the BC long COVID clinics? Well, this morning I just saw something that 98% of people in the province have antibodies to wow. COVID. So uh, yeah. it's interesting to see what that means because I haven't been infected. And so I might oh. be one of the 2% of people. Uh, but at the onset of the, the pandemic, many of us... Uh, figured that we would see about 10% of patients develop long COVID. And this is based on other studies of post-viral syndrome. Specifically, there's a Dubo study that looked at what happens after infections. And what they found is that after almost any infection, about 10% of people go on to have 
persistent symptoms that fit into those categories of fatigue, pain, sleep disturbance, brain fog, unexplained symptoms. Mm -hmm. What we don't and the prevalence. And so that means that with chronic fatigue syndrome, the patient fibromyalgia, the patients that I'm seeing now have had it at least for a while. And so I never see patients who, because they'd usually take a while to get to me, who've only had it for six months or a year or a year and a half. The average time to get a diagnosis for those two conditions is five years. So mm -hmm. out of that 10% of patients who, who will fulfill criteria, we're not sure how many of those will get completely better and how many, should, how many of those will be partially better and how many of those will have persistent symptoms of chronic fatigue syndrome and fibromyalgia. But if we look at the last census in 2017 in Canada, about 20%, sorry, about uh, one in 20 or 5% of the population already fulfill criteria for this. So this is an, an invisible, underserviced, under-researched, under-educated condition that we already see a lot of. But what we expected and what we worry about is the flood of patients we're going to see moving forward. And the consequences, not only at the individual level, but at the societal and economical level. Yeah, I mean, that's for sure. We're definitely seeing many more cases of this. But one of the issues on people with long COVID are having is that often they're told about their healthcare providers that their disease is in their head or they're stressed out or burned out. And there's a study, I don't know if you saw it, the University of Alberta published in Lancet, that patients that were stigmatized by not having their long COVID recognized had poor quality of life, poor outcomes, and lengthy recovery. Uh, what do you think about this? So that's one of the predictions that I was completely wrong on. When mm -hmm. I, at the beginning of the pandemic, I thought there would be a silver lining of these diseases being recognized and acknowledged. Mm -hmm. And instead, when I started seeing patients, I was hearing the same stories about gaslighting that I was hearing for decades in my patients with chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia. And so if you go to my website, which is there for my name, uh, there's an interview with me uh, by a physician on medical gaslighting. And that was one of my main messages when I was in charge of the long COVID education was this is real, this is disabling, and this has huge consequences because pa patients may not be supported by family, friends, physicians, insurers, the government. So mm -hmm. for anybody who's interested, uh, at the same website, there is a link uh, on the first page to a YouTube presentation that I did called Family and Friends, which delves into these conditions, but has two main agendas. The first agenda is to legitimize this as a real disease. And number two, to give a sense of what it's like living with an invisible illness that is not widely recognized. I mean, this disease is, you know, as you said, going to have huge impacts in our society. But, you know, is there anything people can do to protect themselves from developing long COVID? Well, I think the best thing that they can do are a couple of things. The first is, you know, people are over COVID, but COVID is not over you. And so I still behave the same way that I did two years ago. And so I think it's nice to hope that COVID is over, but it's not. The second thing is immunization. And the third thing is if you're in one of the risk groups, getting Paxlovid uh, as soon as you can. In terms, mm -hmm. of, in terms of metformin, I'm not sure that the data is robust enough for us to act on it yet. So, I mean, you probably read the article in JAMA last week, March 23rd, that found that Paxlovid, you mentioned Paxlovid, reduced the risk of long COVID in people that were unvaccinated, vaccinated, and boosted, and in people with primary SARS-CoV-2 infection and reinfection by 26%. But in BC, currently, to qualify for Paxlovid, you have to be immunocompromised, indigenous, and vaccinated, or 70 years old with three chronic medical conditions. What do you think about this? Well, I think that's an error in policy, unfortunately. Um, you know, the, the initial guidelines in the province were really to do two things, to prevent hospitalization, to prevent death. But they weren't looking at pre preventing morbidity. 
And so for patients who already have chronic fatigue syndrome or patients who already have COVID, getting it a second time might mean a new lower level of function. So those patients are at high risk of further morbidity. And I think preventing long COVID in the way that I've defined it is just as important as preventing the tissue damage, preventing hospitalization, and preventing, um, preventing death. In fact, we're probably going to have a bigger impact on society by preventing the morbidity than we are by preventing the hospitalization and death. Yeah, I totally agree. And now, are there any treatments besides Paxil currently for long COVID? So right now we're treating long COVID uh, mostly with treatments that are repurposed from other conditions. The funding for this research has been really low in the past. And so unlike cardiology, which is you know, serviced by a lot of high quality evidence in randomized controlled trial, in these conditions, we actually often use just a, a rule of thumb of cost, benefit, and risk. If the risk is low, if the cost is reasonable, and the benefit is potential, we sometimes try things at a lower level of evidence because if we wait for this, the, the kind of evidence they have in cardiology, we'll likely never get it. And so it tends to be uh, symptom-based and we tend to focus on improving sleep, pain, uh, mm -hmm. brain fog, things like that. Mm. Now, beyond the medical, what support or services do people with long COVID need that aren't currently being provided? So I think that this patient population really needs a multi uh, professional approach similar to what we developed at the Complex Chronic Diseases Program. And that's why in my own practice, which is very not the norm, I invite different experts uh, every week to give lectures to my patients. And we, we have anywhere from 150 to 250 patients present, but we've had naturopaths, occupational therapists, physiotherapists, dietitian, uh, and a whole bunch of other experts in Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, mast cell activation, because two groups that are likely to get long COVID are patients with mast cell activation syndrome and patients who are super flexible, which is called uh, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome hypermobile. Yeah, now you mentioned your multidisciplinary teams for treatment. Um, and, you know, I, I note that the long COVID clinics from BC are all being closed on April 1st. And yeah. so what's the reason for them closing when long COVID cases are increasing? I think it's, it's again, a policy error. Um, they've made a few errors in my, in my mind. The first was to not accept patients initially who did not test positive for COVID because a lot of patients at the beginning of the pandemic either had no testing available, and there's also a possibility of false negatives with screening tests. Mm -hmm. The second thing they did is that at one point they restricted access to the clinic for patients who were hospitalized. And I think hospitalization is a good way of identifying people with the tissue damage. But in fact, out of all the patients I've seen, I've only had one or two patients who've been hospitalized. The vast majority of the patients who've been severely disabled, just had a regular flu-like illness, not requiring treatment, not requiring hospitalization. And so I think that, unfortunately, they're closing early uh, before we see the big wave of what's going to happen with these patients. There's, there's a few of us who are interested, but I, there's no way that myself and a small number of physicians across the province can handle all of these patients. We're doing our best to be creative in handling large number of patients and educating them, but it's just not sustainable. And we're already kind of thinking, you know, uh, to be perfectly honest, I was worried about doing this presentation because I'm worried that I'm going to get, you know, a thousand extra consultations in the next couple of weeks. So <laughs> I think, uh, like you, that it's unfortunate that those clinics are being closed uh, when we need them most. Rick, you know, thank you so much for doing this work with long COVID. I mean, we we're just very happy to, that, to have doctors like you available. And yes, I do think you're going to get a lot of referrals after this, for sure. Uh, <laughs> uh, a recent report in the Toronto Star said that long COVID is going to impact the economy and be a mass disabling event in Canada. 
Yeah. Long COVID has also been called the parallel pandemic. Do you agree yep. with this? And uh, how is it going to impact our society? Absolutely. Because if we look at the Stats Canada uh, report that I mentioned earlier, that patients who are severe enough to fulfill diagnostic criteria for chronic fatigue syndrome fibromyalgia in the Canadian census, fewer than half of those patients were able to work. So that's going to be a huge drain on disability resources. And it's going to be a huge drain on being, you know, for people who are doing different kinds of work. Because unfortunately, mm -hmm. I have patients who have special expertise who, like many people, think that they're indispensable and they push through their COVID symptoms because, because they want to help. But what they end up doing is locking themselves in at a low level of function. One of my patients who has who ha, who ha, who works in in flooding uh, pushed herself through her symptoms to the point where she's been bed bound for a year and is only starting to sit up in mm -hmm. the last couple of months. And it looks like right now that she's unlikely likely ever to return to work. Wow, that's that's a, a terrible situation. Uh, you know, I'm also seeing a lot of these type of patients and people in my practice, unfortunately. Now. Can you give us maybe a glimmer of hope of long COVID? Yeah, I think the glimmer of hope, the silver lining is number one, education like you're doing. So I think this is fantastic. Uh, we need to share the load. We need to take better care of these patients. But we also need to take better care of the patients who have been uh, neglected, like the chronic fatigue fibromyalgia patients in the past. The second glimmer of hope is the amount of money that's been earmarked for research. Already, the amount of research that's coming is huge. It's mm -hmm. created a vacuum. It's brought in a lot of smart people in different areas, physiology, infectious diseases. And so the U.S. has earmarked 1.15 billion with a B. Mm -hmm. And I'm hoping that Canada will follow suit and you mm -hmm. know, dedicate a proportional amount of money as well. Yeah, that's amazing. That's um that's really amazing uh, to hear that and really exciting. And, you know, we at uh, Protective Problems BC are all optimists. So we're all looking forward to this new research to help us along COVID. Um, is there anything else you'd like to add that we haven't covered so far? Um, not that I can think of. I'm happy to answer any questions. Oh, okay. That's fantastic. So I think there are probably some, uh, here we go. How can we effectively communicate about long COVID to local children, uh, local clinicians in our provinces? I hear misunderstandings from clinicians, and I would love to know how we can help clinicians stay up to date. Yeah, and so the, you know, I was in charge of long COVID education a, a couple of years ago, and unfortunately, we didn't reach as many as many doctors as I had hoped. But uh, and so. I'm not sure what's happening now at the long COVID clinics, but I think that rather than being a one-off, that this should be a, um, an ongoing series of education programs for doctors. They should be recorded. They should be attached to CME credits to provide mm -hmm. incentive. Um, so I'm hoping that, that there'll be a more interest in, also developing what I call a toolkit because mm -hmm. family physicians just feel overwhelmed because of the complexity and they need some tools to help them manage these patients. And so when I had organized the long COVID, I had organized it into uh, the primary care toolkit as a concept. You know, Rick, um, I'm involved with the divisions of family practice in Richmond and there's divisions um, all across the province. I think this would be an excellent way to uh, put out your toolkit. So maybe you and I can talk about that later, but yeah. I think that would be an excellent way. Yeah. Um, and I'm also happy to do grand rounds or provincial grand rounds mm -hmm. uh, um, and help in any way that I can. Yeah, I think most of the hospitals still do ground. I think they're back to doing some grand rounds again, the educational session. That, that'd be a great idea. And let's see, we're gonna wait for the next question. So why do some people develop POTS after a COVID infection? So I mentioned earlier that dysautonomy or a problem with the autonomic or adrenaline nervous system is one of the common 
uh, unexplained symptoms in this patient population. And so I've seen lots of POTS, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. For those people who are watching, it's a fancy way of saying postural means going from lying to standing. Orthostatic means the same thing. So I think it's just to have a fancy acronym. Tachycardia, fast heart rate. So these are people who go from lying to standing and get dizzy and sometimes even faint because as their heart rate increases, the amount of blood flow that the heart pushes out to the brain decreases. And so the, this can be very disabling. It's easy to diagnose and it's easy to treat, which is why we need to get the education out there. 90% of my patients get away with just salt. And we're talking a lot of salt, nine grams a day. And only about 10% require medication. To make a diagnosis, some doctors are you know, trying to get patients sent for tilt table testing. And I don't think that this patient population needs tilt table testing. I think they get away easily with Nassau lean test. In fact, the Nassau lean test is more sensitive and more specific for POTS. The only time you would really require a tilt table is if you're trying to rule out other conditions as well as POTS that might be interacting. But if you're pretty sure this is POTS, the best thing to do is a NASA lean test, which a patient can do first thing in the morning for 10 minutes. And there's a handout on my website on the NASA lean test. There's a handout on the salt treatment. And on the handout, there's a bunch of links for educational material for patients. I think you've answered most of the next question, but what's the prognosis for young people diagnosed with POTS? So there's a couple things that we know, that young people are more likely to get better, that people who have early disease are likely to get better, and that people who have less severe disease are likely to get better. Uh, this is not research-based, this is just from my observations over several years. Um, the other thing that I predict, and we'll have to see if it pans out, is patients who have a large number of central sensitivity syndromes like pre-existing fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue, PTSD, uh, migraines, interstitial cystitis are also less likely to get better. After the initial couple, three years, the spontaneous remission rate is about 10%. So 10% of people will have what I call a remission. I never use the word recovery mm -hmm. because most of those patients never get back to 100%. And if they're not careful, they're at high risk of having a relapse in their symptoms. Hmm. That's really interesting. Um, now there's a question in the chat box. What is the role of low dose naltrexone in the treatment of long COVID? So the low-dose naltrexone is a perfect example of a medication that's being repurposed that is low risk, likely effective, and low cost. And so this to me is something that, that I offer my patients, even though the, the study results have not come out. There's enough results from other studies where there's neuroinflammation and enough experience with patients with chronic fatigue syndrome that this is uh, worth trying. The interesting thing is that until a few years ago, out of my three questions, risk, benefit, cost, the problem was cost because it had to be compounded. But a study a few years ago showed that it's stable and liquid for over six months. So now what I do is I prescribe three tablets a month. I get patients to crush them and I get the pharmacist to and put it in liquid and I get the pharmacist to give them a syringe and they take it by mouth. So anybody who's interested, my website under resources and medication handouts, there's a handout on the recipe for how to make it, how to crush the tablet. And there's a handout on how to prescribe it and for how patients to take it. But I think that that's definitely one that's worth trying. And would that be for any patient with long COVID, the naltrexone? Or any? Well, because naltrexone works high up the chain or the dominoes of how this disease uh, happens, you know, I always say that naltrexone puts the glee back in the glial cells, that the glial cells are unhappy because they're activated and there's neuroinflammation. Studies have shown that on average, naltrexone reduces neuroinflammation by 
about 20% in patients with fibromyalgia. And mm -hmm. that, that, that corresponds to a 15 to 20% improvement in symptoms widely. Mm -hmm. um, there's also studies to show that severity of chronic fatigue syndrome is associated with how high the uh, neuroinflammatory markers are. So we've got a lot of good peripheral data. We don't have the large randomized controlled trials. Mm -hmm. There is a randomized controlled trial right now in long COVID, but the results have not yet been published. But in terms of risk, benefit, cost, I think it's one that's worth considering. Sounds great. Recent studies show immunocompromised people are still at risk for COVID after three shots. What's medically available to them to prevent long COVID? So I'm not an expert in immune, immunocompromised populations, but I think the same things that I've talked about before would be just as important. Act like we're early in the pandemic, so don't make any changes in your behavior. Make sure that you're fully immunized. And if you do have early symptoms, access Paxlovid as early as you can. Can you please clarify or explain central sensitivity syndrome? Okay, so if you can see the name on the screen, what's missing from that name is an S at the end because central sensitivity syndrome uh, with the S at the end is what we're talking about. There's no such thing as central sensitivity syndrome. It's just an umbrella term. It's just a family name for conditions that run together that seemingly have central sensitivity syndrome as a common feature. Some people don't like the name and it doesn't matter if you like or don't like the name because it's just a name. What's important is to know the cluster of conditions that run together. And the reason you wanna know what they are is because they provide levers for extra treatment. So for instance, if you have long COVID with IBS, we can treat the irritable bowel syndrome. If you have long COVID with migraines, we can treat the migraines. If you have long COVID with interstitial cystitis, urologists have treatment for that. So the, the family of conditions includes chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia, myofascial pain syndrome, tension headaches, migraines, irritable bowel syndrome, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, central abdominal pain syndrome, irritable larynx syndrome, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And these are all conditions that because the problem is not at a level that you can see under the microscope or that you can see on scans, uh, often has been termed functional or psychiatric or somatoform, which is, I think, incorrect. Physicians have a short memory. They forget that MS used to be a, a functional or a somatic disorder or a psychiatric disorder until we invented the MRI. And so I think that that's where physicians fall into what I call the Sherlock Holmes fallacy. Some people may or may not know that the author for Sherlock Holmes was a physician and Sherlock Holmes main theory was that once you've ruled out every possible cause, whatever is left over is the cause, no matter how unlikely. The problem with that and why I call it the Sherlock Holmes fallacy is that it assumes a priori that you know what all the possibilities are, and we never do. And so in, for physicians, unfortunately, is whenever they've ruled out everything that they know or that we have the technology to identify, anything that's left over is described as somatic, functional, or psychological. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's very unfortunate for sure. Is there any consensus on the mechanism for long COVID? Constitutively expressing autoantibodies or cellular autoimmunity? And so all of these are things that happened and we don't know how they're interconnected because we don't have enough research yet. There's, there's likely a component of autoantibodies. There's likely a component of autoimmunity. There's a component of systemic and neuroinflammation. There's, there's problems with macrophages and, and, and uh, lymphocytes. Uh, and so we, we're only scratching the surface of understanding uh, this big messy condition. And part of the reason that, that you know, all the tests come back normal is that most of those tests or things that I've talked about 
are only available to researchers. They're not things that we do mm -hmm. in clinical practice. I know many of those tests, uh, we couldn't even order them if we wanted to. Exactly. Uh, currently, yes. To your knowledge, mm -hmm. was any, for lack of a better term, cost-benefit analysis mm -hmm. of 10% of cases of long COVID plus provincial letter rip strategies ever conducted? I'm not sure I uh, understand what the question <laughs> means. Can you help me? Um, I think that um, they're saying that you know, is a province saying that this is maybe not worthwhile treating because it's only going to affect 10% of the people uh, that have COVID, having long COVID? Uh, okay, okay. So whenever you're looking at a disease, you're looking at something called a DALY, D-A-L-Y, mm -hmm. Disability Adjusted Life Years. So if you have a condition that is relatively common, but doesn't cause any morbidity or mortality, it's not having an impact on population. But if you have a disease that's relatively common that has a huge impact on the population, and so a DALI is a way of looking at burden of disease on society. And the interesting thing is that chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia, they have a DALI that's actually worse than HIV and AIDS. And in a study in, thir in 2013, HIV AIDS was getting five billion with a B dollars of funding, whereas chronic fatigue syndrome is getting five million. Mm -hmm. And if both of them were getting their fair share of the research money, they would have both been getting around 250 million based on the impact on society. So it has a huge dally, a huge disability adjusted life year impact, a huge impact on society bigger than HIV. Right. And I know we already talked about how we think that long COVID in the future is going to have a huge impact. Uh, and even if it's now quoted as 14.8% uh, of mm -hmm. people with COVID in long COVID, that's probably just an underestimation, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. For people with high blood pressure or high blood sugar, would you still recommend salt? No, so there's a subgroup of patients with POTS who have something called hyperadrenergic POTS. And these are people who either have high baseline blood pressure or when they do the NASA lean test, their blood pressure rises rather than decreases or stays, uh, or, or stays the same. So for high blood pressure, no. For high blood sugar, it would depend because the, the majority of patients with these conditions already have low blood pressures. And when we're expanding their blood volume, we're expanding the, the blood flow and circulation to their brain and organs. And with th that patient population, I make sure that they, that they watch their blood pressure. It might start off at 90 over 60, that they don't let their blood pressure climb above 115. And, but these are just recommendations based out of logic and out of, um, out of my experience. They are not supported by any randomized trials because those trials don't exist. Well, yeah, thank you very much on that. Um, so this is kind of a, a re-asking of that question, a clarification. So if the government took into account long COVID costs the economy um, before letting it rip, do you think the government has taken account long COVID costs the economy before letting it rip? You're gonna have to help me with that one, Susan. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's saying, this person is asking that, uh, did they actually believe that long COVID uh, was gonna be uh, this serious when we've kind of lifted all the protections? I don't think they did because like I said, at the beginning of the pandemic, experts were stumped by this group of patients who went on to have symptoms because they didn't appreciate uh, the impact of these conditions because our, our medical system has really not paid attention to post-viral syndromes because they're invisible. And so, for instance, 
in 2015, which is the last data that I have, two-thirds of medical schools in North America did not have chronic fatigue or fibromyalgia in their curriculum, despite mm-hmm. the fact that it affects one in 20 people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's, that's very true. I don't think I learned about that until after I started practice, right? Very true. And, um, you know, kind of in the same line of questioning. So, you know, we are now many family doctors like myself seeing patients who have been told by WorkSafe, even though they're still very symptomatic for the long COVID, that they should go back to work, even though they're very symptomatic and not doing well. So what do you think about this situation? So what we know about, you know, one of the, the, apart from this is real, the only other message that was important for me when I was in charge of long COVID education was don't push patients. Because what we do know is when you push patients through symptoms, you lock them into a low level of function. I'm going to say something very controversial, but I'm okay with saying it, is that WorkSafe BC is an unethical organization because they have no accountability which means that in 33 years, every case of disability that I've been involved with, DTC, CPP, LTD, I've won. Every case of WorkSafe BC, I've lost. And so five people with no medical experience can say, don't believe your doctor and leave it at that with no recourse for patients. And so what I'm hoping is that a nurse gets declined and that we're able to take it public so that she's declined for long COVID and we make it public and we, and we make people aware and we make them angry at the fact of how they're treating patients. The thing luckily that they've learned a little bit is they were pushing nurses back to work early. Now they're less, they're doing it less so, but their, their focus, you know, I offered to participate uh, in, a, in a workshop that they were doing at UBC Education. They're doing a workshop on UBC Education that was getting your patients back to work. And yes. I said, hang on a sec. Can we also have a, uh, thing that maybe your patient shouldn't be going back to work. How to assess if your patient should be going back to work? Because one of the things that I hear when I see these patients is, my family doctor pushed me back to work. My insurer pushed me back to work. Family doctors learned that the longer you've been off, the less likely you are to return, which is true. But maybe the less the reason you're less likely to return is you're disabled enough not to be able to return. And mm-hmm. so I think that there's too much emphasis on getting back to work as opposed to assessing. And so when I when I help patients with their long-term disability, the the main thing I say is when you're doing your gradual return to work, that you are not deconditioned. So a lock step to where you kind of slowly get bad. So that's not going to work. You're going back to work to assess how much you can do. Where is your ceiling? And so we're going to make you go up each step slowly, and we're going to stop when your disease pushes back. But that's not the, the, um, that's not the approach that disability takes. They are focused on work hardening, which we have lots of high quality data literature to show is harmful. Uh-huh. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. And you know, I also saw that educational session uh, that works like BC was giving, and I was very skeptical. I didn't attend it actually. Uh, you know, I think it's unfortunately uh, the way that WorkSafe is going these days. And actually, I, I after the session, I do have a case for you that uh, you know, that nurse that you mentioned. We may have a case, so let's talk about that. Perfect. What test should a GP order to look at neurotransmitter markers? None. I can't even, they don't exist for us to be able to do. And more importantly, even if they did exist, they don't guide diagnosis or treatment. And so some of those special tests that Susan and I were talking about are available privately. And I have patients who ask me, should I do natural killer cells? Should I do this or that or the other thing? And I say, no, because they're not biomarkers. They will not help solidify the diagnosis and they're not, used for guiding therapy. And Mm -hmm. so they're interesting, 
but they're not important. And so unfortunately, we don't have any tests uh, to, to guide us. The reason you would do tests, and there's, uh, I'm going to put this on my website, it's not there yet, is what a basic workup should look like for this patient population. Because we've developed this at BC Women's, and there's one thing that's clear with the Institute of Medicine report in 2015, that these conditions are not di diagnoses of exclusion. Mm -hmm. that you need to do some basic stuff, like make sure the patient doesn't have liver disease, kidney disease, hypothyroidism, anemia, hepatitis, HIV. But beyond some basic blood work, these patients do not need a lot of imaging. One of the areas that we fall into trouble is that one of the diagnostic criteria and common symptoms for, for these post-viral syndromes is shortness of breath. Mm -hmm. But if you learn to ask the questions, and because it's not dyspnea or shortness of breath like physicians know it, it's can't get air in. So if you ask the patient, is this like after you've run after the bus and you feel short of breath, they say no, it's like can't get air in. And so because COVID is a lung infection, a lot of patients are getting either worked up too much or not worked up enough. And so there's a validated study called the SIT-STAND test. And what you can do, and the patient can do this at home or in the physician's office, is they put an oxygenation, an oxygen saturation monitor on their finger. And if their baseline oxygen saturation is below 96%, they need to be worked out. Then what they do is they sit, they stand, they sit, they stand, they sit, they stand, they sit, they stand for one minute. At the end of that one minute, if their oxygen saturation has dropped by three or more percent, they need to be worked out. And if not, it's likely that this is just the post-viral syndrome. And this, is, this has been validated specifically in the long COVID population. And mm -hmm. so this is something that family physicians and patients can do that will save us a lot of money and that will, because we won't have to do CT scans, MRIs, pulmonary function tests, and we'll save respirology, um, respirology consultations. Rick, we really need to get you to come talk to the divisions of family practice, really. <laughs> How can we find out if there's a viral persistence? So the viral persistence theory is interesting because that was a popular theory for, theory for chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia. People may or may not know that the BC CDC is world famous. They're the ones who identified the SARS virus. They mm -hmm. also looked at identifying a, a virus in patients with chronic fatigue syndrome and fibromyalgia and were unable to find one. What they did more recently is a metabolomic study. And metabolomic is to look at what is being ex expressed in your system. So for instance, we all have genes that help us fight infection, but they're not working right now because we don't have an infection. And there is a signature for persistence viral infection. And so what the BCCDC did is they looked at patients with chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, um, chronic Lyme disease, and lupus and controls. And they were unable to find any evidence of viral persistence. There is a subgroup of researchers right now who are looking into that, and it'll be really interesting. Mm -hmm. But some of the conflicting information is that we now know that our body keeps pieces of viruses to help us fight immune in the future. And so that just because you have antibody tests or you have pieces of the virus does not mean that you have active viral infection or, or viral mm -hmm. replication. So right now, uh, you know, I'm agnostic in terms of if we find research that shows viral persistence, that we'll go with that. But currently, it's just one of the theories, and there isn't enough um, there isn't enough evidence to to suggest treatment. So, in that cost risk benefit, cost is way too high, risk is way too high, and benefit mm -hmm. not proven enough. So, I have a rule of thumb that the more uh, substantial the claim, the higher quality of evidence that we need, especially if a treatment is costly or if a treatment mm -hmm. has potential high risk. Mm -hmm. So that's why you might ask me, why wouldn't I use an antiviral, but I'm okay with using low-dose naltrexone. That would be my explanation. That's a great answer. Thank you. Um, are patients with ME-CFS at greater risk of getting long mm -hmm. COVID? 
So, like I said, I you know I don't think that we needed the term long COVID. We could have used post viral syndrome, some of which are severe enough to become chronic fatigue syndrome or fibromyalgia. So for patients with pre-existing fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue syndrome, it's like another hit. And so what we hope is that they will have a flare of symptoms, but get back to baseline. But a lot of them actually, what happens is they get a flare and they stay at a new, a new low level of function, mm -hmm. which why I encourage them to get vaccinated, which I would love to see that Paxlovid available to this patient population because of the, the potential impact, impact individually, these patients may not already not be working. But when you're already at a low level of function, losing another 20% is huge mm -hmm. because you're not starting at 100%. Yes, I totally agree. I, I'm, myself, I work in long-term care and we're seeing a lot of people in long-term care after they get COVID infections, that their level deteriorates even further. What can a patient ask for to push for MRI to detect microclotting? Mount Sinai Professor Petrino's lab and Professor Pretorius at Stellenbach have determined 100% of long haulers having microclotting. Yeah, so this goes back to what I said before, is that long haulers in this case was described as PASC, post-acute sequelae of COVID, and or long COVID. So I'm not sure that the way that we've defined long COVID that those patients have microclots. The second thing is, if you find them, what are you going to do with them? Nothing. And so it doesn't guide diagnosis and it doesn't guide treatment. So right now, it would be a waste of resources. Mm -hmm. Can POTS be diagnosed with a 24-hour Holter monitor? Well, you can see evidence of it, but you can't diagnose it. Because let's say I run to the corner and my heart rate goes up to 150 from a baseline of 70. That will look the same as, as POTS. And so it, it, you, you, you don't need a Holter monitor to diagnose POTS. If you're considering another diagnosis, it might be worth it, but it's a waste of money. The, the, the more sensitive, more specific to do um, to do the, the NASA lean test. And I usually get patients to do it two separate days, one day with heart rate, one day with blood pressure, so that we can identify patients who have hyperadrenergic POTS, a rise in blood pressure, but also another subgroup of patients that you don't hear a lot about, which is called neurally mediated hypo with an O tension, which is a fancy way of saying low blood pressure. So a lot of these patients on top of having POTS, we'll have a drop in blood pressure because their baseline blood pressure is 90 and now it goes to 80 or 75. And the good news about that is if we find that, that 90% of those patients are equally well treated with just salt repletion. That's great. I don't think we have any more questions. Um, so thanks to Dr. Arsenault and our listeners for spending this last hour with us. For those of you who would like more information about long COVID from Dr. Arsenault, please take a look at his website at drrickarsenault.ca. For people struggling now with long COVID, we at Protect Our Province BC see you, we believe you, and we will keep advocating for you. We want to leave you with these wise words shared with us from Lynette, a person with long COVID. You know, I think if, if we had a, an epidemic of people with broken limbs and we saw people in plasters and crutches, it would be more evidence, but there's a lot of disability that's happening, which is a hidden disability often, which is why I think it's really important to talk about it more and for people to understand what the consequences are and that will help to make better decisions. You know, I think if, if we had a, an epidemic of people with broken limbs and we saw people in plasters and crutches, it would be more evident. But there's a So thank you very much, everyone. Um, before we leave, we wanted to announce a session from the Occupational Health Clinics for Ontario Workers this Friday, March 31st, with Dr. Tara Moriarty on managing health and safety without public COVID protective measures. But thank you very much to our listeners again and to Dr. Rick Arsenault. 
Arifu, for coming today for this interview.